Perfect. No, it's not. No? It's flickering. It's flickering, huh? Okay. Just run it regular, though. Let's see if that does something. Give it a second, make sure nothing <laughs> exciting occurred. Let me, you know what, then well, let's just run your record here and bypass this thing and see if that, okay. that makes the it's signal It's already work. recording. Do you want me to stop and yeah. restart it? Um, no, we'll just pass it through. Okay, so this one's got to go. No news is good news. Okay, I think it's... And the audio is already recording? The audio will be off of your, uh, just off of the, the laptop. So pick it up. Um, so this picks up? No, uh, no, it will just be the speakers built in, the mic. So I don't really need to be tethered if I'm No, not. you don't need to be tethered. Okay. All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to do perhaps a, a little bit of a, a different format today. Um, I, I've been talking about change management for a couple of years, but I am in no way a professional on it. Uh, it is simply something that I do on a regular basis as a project manager. Am I speaking loud enough for the folks at the back of the room? Because I can use my like full-on voice if I need to. Um, so I'm going to start out by basically getting you to tell me why you're here today. And then I'm going to give you some frameworks for addressing some of the challenges that you're currently dealing with, whether it's at work or in the Drupal community or wherever it happens to be. Uh, and then I'll share some of the stories that I have from uh, the things that have been effective uh, and the conditions of uh, the conditions of stress that resulted in me needing to find solutions for the problems that we were having. Um, so the, the first thing that I do uh, want to do is kind of um, just make sure that when I say change management, this isn't one of my Git talks. This is the, the, the business side of change management, and we're talking about the transformation uh, into a desired state. And so in this case, we're probably referring to Drupal 8 and the uh, difficulties that we're about to undergo as development teams from a technology that we've been using for probably a number of years into a technology that is going to feel foreign and uh, stressful and, you know, from a site builder point of view, not that different. From, from a development point of view, whether you're front end or back end, there's, there's going to be a lot of differences and how do we make that transformation over. Um, my sort of uh, general approach to working with new teams is to start at that point of um, coming to a common understanding. And I've, I, I do appreciate that whiskey is not required um, but I have found that in a social setting and sort of that, that casual conversation about how things are going, what's motivating you, what's, you know, what's the challenge, what's the hard part, um, it could be laser tag, it could be whatever your team um, can come together on in terms of a non-work environment. This isn't a, a scheduled uh, scrum meeting that happens on day X of thing Y. Um, but, it, you know, in a casual setting, you can get a lot more information from people. I um, mean, my, uh, one of the biggest challenges that I had professionally in most recent years, the, the transformation process started when I showed up at a work sprint. So we were a distributed team. When I showed up at a work sprint and said, okay, here's the bottle of whiskey, and we're going to talk through uh, what's not working. And it was from that point forward that... Um, we, we started to see the small wins that we needed to transform the team. So whiskey not required, uh, but I have found it to be an effective tool as a project manager. Um, so I would like um, just to have you throw out some of the things that you're currently dealing with, uh, just so that we can get a sense of where the room is at. It may then also be if you look around and see who's um, got what kind of challenges that after this you can support one another uh, in um, you know, whether it's boss here or whether it's just sort of ongoing, if you've got common challenges, being aware of who you might use as a resource in the future. So is there anyone that wants to kick off, why are you here today? The answer may be because it was easier than moving after Karen's presentation. I'm totally cool with that because I have done that myself. I'm just checking email. Oh, goodness, it's not Karen anymore. Um, <laughs> 
I'm being recorded. I should probably not be quite as <laughs> honest with you. <laughs> Although transparency is important. Um, anyone want to? Yeah, yeah so, so I've had, uh, in project management uh, process, uh, there's often many parties involved. Yes. And as the person who's actually building websites, um, there are often many decisions being made with personal agendas yeah. and uh, competing personal agendas yeah. often. And so um, I'm, sometimes I'm privy to those and I can influence them. Sometimes I'm not. Mm -hmm. So at some point you come down to the chain where like there's a, you know, a creative madness somehow has made it through the, through the chain of things. And so I find that that is a, um, a challenge for, for, I need to initiate change. Yeah. And, uh, but I may not be politically in a Empowered. position, yeah, yeah, in a position to CMO actually, not a good idea. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever. And so sure. that those, uh, you know, I would love to hear about creative ways of politely nudging. Sure. Yep. Folks Hurting cats. It. Yeah. Yep. Sweet. Uh, what are some of the other, thank you for sharing. What are some of the other things that folks are, yeah. Um, Hello. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Also, we are changing the collateral from small size company to a size size company. And the company, the company offers to the four year machine computing structure from four people to twenty five people in non web ten days. Yeah. The current thing is how to, how to keep everybody uh, in sync or up to date on what's going on without sucking up <laughs> all the time in meetings. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And it's even, I would say, uh, meetings are even worse for distributed teams because you have the, or with, when you have anyone who is remote or not a co-located team, because you have the uh, context switching of, I was doing work, and now I need to turn and think about getting into Google Hangout. Is my microphone working? Is everything set up? Um, or Skype or you know, whatever you're using, um, even though I've been listening to audio and something else. So you have this initial um, friction for a distributed team to even begin a meeting. So they're, they're even worse to suck people into meetings for distributed teams. Yes. No, hang out yet. Yes. <laughs> In the white t-shirt. <laughs> I don't have it in the presentation, but you will want to watch uh, Todd Nierkirks, who is from Fork Kitchen, his presentation on um, creating, uh, empowering people to implement their own changes uh, within teams. And I think it was, I think that was what he presented at um, Twin Cities Drupal Camp. And I know, I know it was recorded, but he has given it at other things. So. Uh, Twin Cities in Minneapolis, Drupal Camp, which was this past weekend. At the back, yep. Uh, I was just thinking around changing the screen. The most recent teachers and regulars, because we have notes every time they're small. Yeah. And now the projects are bigger. We have to share how to use that change, the process, the tactics, or whatever. Yep. Good times to get to the Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a nice title to a presentation, which was something to the effect, it was a lullabot presentation on Martha Stewart, something about changing the wheels at 50 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, I 
I'd be interested in, um, in how you, your thoughts on dealing with clients who, uh, whose projects have become now big. Maybe they had a little site yeah. one day uh, at one point, but now it's a big piece, and they still don't have this concept of those little changes uh, that they want to make, having potentially big impacts um, with regression bugs coming up, and, and that they know, like, how do you temper their desire to just make that quick little change in the home? Uh, Jeff Patton's User Story Mapping, that's the book you'll want to read. Uh, and I think I have it in the resource list, but it's kind of different than what we'll be doing, but that will be a good resource for you. Maybe one more, and then I'll go into the framework stuff. Yes? There's different, uh, um, there's different types in line, so if it's All right, so that was great, um, I think, to hear just a, a sense of where you're coming from, the, the challenges are that you're dealing with right now. And um, I talked about this, uh, for anyone who was at my presentation last year, I talked a bit more about Simon Sinek's um, why. I'm blanking on the full title of that right now. Uh, and he, he had this sort of um, uh, really great TED Talk, it's 20 minutes long, but this really great statement that resonated with me, especially having run for election, that uh, we tend to, as staff people, want to work toward something. So we want to know what the vision is and we want to work toward something. However, I can tell you that in politics, um, working toward something doesn't really work. Um, negative attack ads are far easier to win supporters on. And so when you're, when you're implementing change, we have this practice uh, sort of in real life of moving away from negativity and being very drawn by negativity and yet to implement change positively in the workplace, we need to teach ourselves how to create a vision and then uh, move people towards that vision. And one of the really hard things about change management is that if you can't get alignment, if you can't get people excited about your vision, expect to have um, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Attrition. Expect people to either mentally check out or actually quit the job. And be pre being prepared for that process, being prepared for uh, people not coming along for the ride is really what change management is all about. Um, I think he's got a lot of interesting uh, pieces in terms of helping people to overcome that resistance and fuel the motivation um, and it all sort of stems back to, well, why are you even doing this? And certainly for uh, Drupal 8, why are you forcing people to learn Drupal 8? And you know, why as a developer have you decided to make that transition? Are clients demanding it yet? Maybe, maybe not. Like, what is it that is your motivation? Whether you know, you're the leader of the company who's decided to make this change or the developer who's decided to take it on. Because once you have that why internalized, it can fuel you through the process. It can get people over that um, initial resistance of, I don't want change. Change is too hard. And if you are keen about it, if you can see that future state, then you can stay motivated when things get difficult. So we, um, we have this sort of less giving up. So that's the quote that goes along with that one. So the, the frameworks that I've got for you, there's uh, essentially two with one kind of in the middle of expanding a bit on how to, as a leadership team, help people through it. Um, but there's two frameworks, and they are sort of the, the recognized by business school frameworks that you will, um, if you Google change management, you'll see. Uh, and the first one is the um, John Cotter. Do I actually say it on there? I don't. Uh, John Cotter, eight steps to uh, leading change or leading uh, to change management. And it's changed at once, so this is version two, well this is kind of like version 2.1, these are my words on top of his, um, his eight steps. 
And the, it was eight steps to begin with. Leading Change was the original book. Accelerate is the, the current book. But there's essentially this process that you're going to have to, um, to go through. And the first step is to create a sense of urgency. The second step is to assemble a senior leadership change transformation team. The third step is to create that vision. Uh, the, the new version is uh, enlist a volunteer army. My goodness, does Drupal know how to enlist their volunteer army? Um, there's some interesting case studies in one of the Harvard Business School like top 10 blah, blah, blah on change management um, about how to find your champions within organizations. And some of you, I, like, I recognize some of your faces. You know that you're the internal champion for your particular company. So you may be the volunteer, even though you're paid. And then enabling people by removing blockers, generating small wins, sustaining that accelerated pace of change, and then finally indoctrinating um, that change into corporate culture. Now, as a project manager, I'm typically focused on this, this these three, I don't know if the um, change was big enough here, um, the enable, Enable people by removing blockers, um, generating wins in terms of helping people closing tickets, and sustaining that momentum through an entire project. So that's typically where I'm focused and often where developers will be focused as well as they work with me as a project manager. So if you've got a leadership team, those ones up at the top may be very, uh, very different, very new concepts for you to grapple with, but I bet you're really good at these three at the bottom if you are... Um, used to working on um, whether it's your own internal projects or, or client sites. So what can we do to actually ensure success during the project from, again, this is using my frameworks, the external um, kind of like business management approved techniques. They, there's a lot of uh, language and discussion around change needing to benefit the leaders because the, the bottom-up approach is quite difficult. So two of you managed um, some kind of senior leader position, whether it was um, uh, marketing or um, VP, you know, top-level folks. If they're not on board, that change management piece is going to be exceptionally difficult. And so your sort of number one priority as a um, bottom-up change management person is going to be to figure out how can I phrase this? What is the Machiavellian technique that I can use to make... <laughs> Eaton just went, Machiavelli? <laughs> um, what, is the, what is the technique that I can use? How can I phrase this in a way so that the leadership sees that this will be of benefit to them? So is this um, uh, uh, faster to profit more clients, like what is it that's going to motivate them, the leader, and how can you pitch it to them in a way that they can start getting on board with it. The next one is to um, figure out, again, the why piece, but coming up with those key phrases or key ideas that you can use within the company to explain why we're doing the transformation, what the final vision is, and providing the skills and upgrading for folks to be able to engage uh, safely. That's really important. Now, in a lot of cases, what the training is that folks want is they don't need to know, they don't, like, they don't need you to read the documentation for them. They need to know where the documentation is stored and the rationale behind what the change was. So why did we move to I, blah, whatever, twig? Why did we move to you know insert whatever the technology is here? I can look up as a technologist, I can look up how to actually do stuff. You don't need to handhold me through those parts, but you need to explain the, the thinking that went behind um, why that technical change was made. Uh, then we need to acknowledge resistance and um, help to uh, overcome or counter people with the overall strategic plan. Well, if you don't have a strategic plan of why you're upgrading to Drupal 8, guess what? It's going to be really, really tricky to get people in alignment, hate the word, but it's a word, um, with why we're actually making this change. Uh, and then finally, which I think this is a really interesting one, is to provide counseling to alleviate fears. And this is personal counseling. This is not just, we're making this change. Here's the 
you know, here's the thing that you need to read in order to understand why, but actually giving that, that personal mentoring time and that support, um, recognizing that change is hard, people fear for their jobs, and helping to make it an exciting change. Um, and then finally, monitoring and fine-tuning. So those are sort of um, some of the steps. And then the, the other thing that's referenced a lot is these sort of five stages of grief. And um, although um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's uh, original definition was to do with, with how we deal with death, um, it comes up fairly frequently in the, the business world for people who are going through a change management process. If it's sort of imposed on them, you're likely to see these. There was a very funny tweet this morning, which was a little bit different, but their five stages of grief was something like, and I, it wasn't for programmers, but it may as well might have been, it was sort of self-loathing, self um, anger, <coughs> hatred, more self-loathing, like no sort of like, yeah, I, I can see how not having a process to go through these steps may result in simply negative feelings. Um, and I think, I think the final one was sweet, sweet acceptance. I, I, I favorited it, but I can't, I can't quite remember all the steps on it now. So, so recognizing there's a structure that other people have come up with. There's some steps that you're probably going to go through as a company. There are um, pieces out there that you can read more about. And these are some of the emotions that you're probably going to be confronted with as your team goes through that transformation. So a few of my kind of uh, tips and tricks, and I, I, in the original presentation description, I broke it into three sections. Uh, these stories are very loosely tied to those three sections. Um, but I, I think that, that I, I became good at working with uh, burnt out teams because of, is this fair to say this? Because of my incredible aversion to conflict, but I actually, um, I'm a fighter. And so I would rather not get started in conflict because it never ends well for everyone in the room. Um, so I started getting really good at figuring out how do I read a room? How do I um, interpret the information that's coming to me so that I can redirect some of those energies. I can restructure a situation to reduce the potential for conflict. And there's, there's another book that's, um, you know, there's, uh, to do with team dynamics. And one of them in forming a team is you have a storming phase where conflict is inevitable. Uh, so I'm very quick to try and get out of that storming phase and figure out, okay, well, this person is an introvert. They, and a fantastic person, they're going to bring positive, amazing ideas to the table, but I need to give them the questions ahead of time so they can show up feeling prepared and empowered to actually present that information and not come to me three days later in a very passive-aggressive kind of way, unintentionally, being like, hey, so I've been thinking about it some more. Like, no, give them the time ahead of time to think about the problems. But, but a lot of these tips and tricks that I've come up with um, are things that I've stumbled into. And I think the, the trick for me was as I started doing these things, recognizing that it was a technique or a pattern which I could apply in other situations and starting to take notes about what I did at work and what did work and what didn't and thinking of it, thinking of my management as an iterative process, thinking of it in terms of like split testing, like hmm, I'm going to try that with this group and that with this group and see which one's effective and then maybe, you know, drop the technique that's not working. So the first one that I have was the, the agile schedule. And I, I have begun to think of, of the, the scheduling as sort of um, a, a, a marathon training. And I, I have never completed a marathon, but I've trained for marathons. Um, and the the, the basic structure is that you build up and then you have a recovery week. And you build up and you have a recovery week. And you build up and you have a recovery week. So as you are planning out the sprint, the project that you're working on with your team, think about structuring the tasks that people will be completing <coughs> in a way that they learn a little bit, learn a little bit, do something they already know. Learn a little bit, learn a little bit, do something they already know. Learn a little bit, learn a little bit, do something they already know. Now, I didn't 
taper it quite as much, but there's also this concept in um, uh, sports training where you have a taper at the end. So the taper at the end, in terms of the agile sort of or like client delivery process, this is going to be your um, your final, perhaps your final QA period if you do that as a separate um, your final push. This gives you, this buys you a little bit of time uh, at the end for unexpected things, but really, you know, not ending on hard stuff, ending on really easy stuff so that you've got that extra time in place. So the, uh, <laughs> the I guess the, the one that is, hmm, the story that comes to mind or the story that I've got written down for this one is to also think about how can you, over the course of the sprint, or over the course of the project rather, sorry, iterate through and plan to replace what you're actually building. So how can you learn incrementally during the project while exposing functionality? And I, I do, um, if you go to, um, if you already have your computer open, gitforteams.com, there's a link there uh, on the home page to the resources for this. There's a link about um, five steps to innovative infrastructure. And the, the line that I keep remembering is plan to replace. And I've done this in uh, sprints where we knew at the end we were going to have to build a PDF generator. Now, it wasn't a Drupal site, but we knew that we were going to have to build this thing. And quite frankly, the uh, dev who was going to end up being responsible for it was kind of freaked out by needing to learn how to do this thing and kept kind of putting it off. I would put it in a sprint. It wouldn't get finished. It was like, hang on a second. Let's figure out how to slice this down into smaller pieces. So we started with a print-friendly style sheet and some extra templates. And then we moved to um, a, uh, an extra page that people were redirected to that wasn't a print-friendly style sheet. That was actually the style sheet that they saw so that we could test to make sure that people were going to be actually needing those PDFs and not wanting the web-friendly version. We checked the browser stats at that point. We validated that we did need to move forward to a PDF server. And then we moved forward finally to the hardest piece, which was actually generating that Docker container with the uh, WK HTML to PDF um, uh, uh, service in place that could accept information from the website. It could accept different uh, URLs, different parameters, those kinds of things. So we got up to that point, and then as the sort of taper off, we deleted what we had originally created in terms of those print-friendly style sheets. But I sliced it down into how can we expose that um, epic into chunks that don't seem that difficult. Print-friendly style sheets, totally straightforward to build. A page that is what they're going to see in their printer, totally straightforward. Okay, no, they really do need to trade PDFs. We knew that all the way along, the client and I did. But we you know, gradually built up to, we planned to replace, we exposed the functionality, we proved that it was going to be useful, and then we finally threw out the original piece. So thinking about how you can schedule that information and coaching people through the, um, the complicated pieces. Okay, we're going to start with the old way of thinking about how to build a theme, but using the new technology. We're not going to worry about best practices. We're just going to start writing things with Twig templates. Okay, now that we're writing two Twig templates, now let's start thinking about what the best practices are, and well, let's refactor what we did, throw out all, our, all of our old way of thinking now that we understand just the technology of how to make a Twig file, now let's learn best practices. You know, some teams may want to work with the best, or start with the best practices, and then, you know, on Drupal 7, let's start building out components, and let's start thinking about how we structure our SAS files, and then all we're learning is Twig when we move over to Drupal 8. So how can you break things down and structure them in a way that allows that sort of slow build easier, Hard, 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 easier. So in terms of the uh, mitigation of learning curve, there are, uh, I guess, three things that I have uh, seen used effectively. One, uh, at phase two, we call it a technical review board 
that's pretty scary sounding. It made sense for a company of 150 or 200 or whatever they're at now. But you plan a document, and then you have all of the, across the entire company, all of the senior level architects come in, and they help to critique. Uh, if you're used to design, if you've ever heard of a design crit, you put the technical plan up, and you have people from other projects come in and critique that plan. And you start to say, you know, what works, what doesn't work. You know, based on my experience, you may want to do your migration sooner. You may want to leave this to the end. But you have a cross-functional, or not cross-functional, I'm sorry, same job title, different teams. And you spend maybe two hours on that technical review. Um, I like working in a Kanban style for teams who are learning new things so that you don't have the stress of not being able to close out a sprint. Anything that's unfinished simply rolls over into the next unit of time. Uh, and then finally, I really like taking time to do uh, weekly internal demos, which are not about proving finished, it's about proving problems. So I, I again, they can be very experienced programmers, but when they're learning new technologies, I love to have folks get on a call and say, this is what I currently can't solve so that the, and we tended to do them on Fridays, at the end of every week, there was absolutely nothing technical that was blocking the team starting Monday. So they could get rolling at the very beginning of the new week. Now, so those are the sort of three points. Plan and review, that's my technical review board. Um, allow fluid scheduling, Kanban, um, and share learning often. So we converted what was a weekly demo into um, just a, a really great, it was essentially pair programming. And I know Drupal isn't really into pair programming the way some other communities are, but the more and more I um, see how, again, this is, I, I've mostly worked with distributed teams, but the how um, delays can really frustrate people and slow them down in terms of like, okay, well I need help, I have to wait for this person to answer my question, like the issue queue, something that could go a lot faster is gonna take a lot more time. But sitting down at the same time and going through pair programming, whatever you want to call it. I, I love pair code reviews. So you sit down with the original developer and the person who's doing the review and you do that review together. Um, I, I love that synchronous experience for learning. And then finally we've got um, the, the motivation piece. And I, um, in the, the first development team that I worked with, so I've been, I've been a, a manager of my own business and a manager of learners for quite some time as a college professor, as a, um, a producer of Drupal training workshops, and my sort of unfortunate um, advantage in those situations is that the folks who showed up wanted to learn. They were in, you know, they would show up for class or they would show up for a workshop because they were ready or because they wanted change to happen. Now, maybe they had been told to show up, uh, but generally speaking, I was going to treat people in the room as a motivated adult learner. Uh, so I took this approach in my uh, first development team experience. And this is a team who had been trying to upgrade from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7 for close to a year. It, they hadn't been able to set the time aside to do it. They were burnt out, they were stressed out, and I showed up with my can-do attitude of, I'm going to tell you what the tickets are and you will happily do them because you're a developer and you love developing. Uh, so there were some challenges. And this is the one where I showed up with a bottle of whiskey. Um, but we, you know, one of the things that we, we talked about was how, because the, in, the, in the resources, um, there's a, a presentation by Joe Schindler at DrupalCon Austin on called something to the effect of how to motivate how to motivate me as a developer. The, the project manager he's complaining about is me, um, but I'm in the audience heckling him, so it's okay. Um, um, but one of the things that that blew my mind initially was he would tell me what he needed to work on next. I would make sure that the ticket was in the sprint and assign it to him, and he would get irritated because he didn't want to be told what to do. 
Well, I wasn't telling him what to do. He told me what he wanted to do. I would put it in the sprint and assign it to him. Like, come on now. <laughs> this is your idea. But we made this really minor change of allowing him to choose whatever ticket he wanted to work on. So he would tell me what he needed to build next, I would put it into the sprint, and he would assign it to himself. And that really, really minor change made a massive amount of difference. And one of the first things that he did in a charmingly, um, I absolutely love Joe. He was just, he changed the way I thought of it, project management. Um, but one of the things he did, back-end developer, he was like, I'm going to take front end ticket. And I was like, all right, we've been trying to, you know, save you from this magical place of front-end development. It's actually a little bit harder than you think. I'm going to take it, and I'm going to like it. And, um, yeah, he took it all right. We sure learned a lot. He'd never used SAS before, if I remember correctly. Uh, there, there was a lot of learning that happened in that first week. And it sort of... He came out of it a much, much stronger developer in front-end technologies, and with also a little bit of like, okay, I see why you were picking those tickets for me now. Um, but that, that degree of choice and that degree of autonomy, people know what they need to work on, but not telling them and letting them self-assign and be like, ah, oh, it's Hangover Monday. I want an easy ticket today. I don't want the hard stuff, but just, just those minor bits of choice. So don't assign, give choice. Um, celebrate wins and uh, have very, very high standards. But in that high standard, don't necessarily make, we need to build this amazingly huge thing. Your very high standard can also allow for rewards and creativity. And by rewards and creativity, I mean, can you think of a cheaper way to expose this business value? Can you think creatively about how to um, duct tape the solution to get something exposed to the client so that we have the opportunity to behind the scenes plan a fuller scaffolding that we can and again this is my PDF server example you know we like we duct tape together the CSS style sheets with the plan of building out a proper infrastructure later on so high standards but not for huge monolithic systems or, or huge fully built functionality, but for amazing work. And finally, ask the developers what motivates them. Have the conversation. Uh, in general, I found that contractors or outside companies are terrified of having choice because they don't have the context to understand which ticket will give the, the, the best win or the highest value to the company who they're working for, for the client who they probably have no context or no contact with, rather. So in, in the cases where I've had uh, an internal development team and an out, outsource uh, sort of plus, plus one or plus some, so I've worked with, with the Ukrainian development teams, I've worked with uh, Indian uh, mobile app developers who are sort of like doing some add-on stuff, those two, outsource, like those two outsource companies did not want to pick tickets. No thank you. They want to know exactly what is expected of them. They want to know exactly what the deadline is. And the more prescriptive you can be and how that ticket gets completed with what technologies and the code, like the more you can give them, the more they're like, okay, that's perfect. Thank you very much. I'm going to go do my work now exactly the way you want. And it's, I don't think it's a cultural thing. I think it's just... Um, I don't have a horse in this race. You make the decisions and I'll make it happen. So that, you know, that don't assign, give choice, that's a really bad tip for some people. So ask them, how do you want to work? How, how can we make this work for you as a team? And that also means if you're talking to people, you can't have one system that's going to exactly work in every single team across the entire company. You can have a framework, you can have a set of guiding principles, but you're going to need to think about this cohesive team, and this is where it gets really hard. It's like, well, that team needs help because they're currently in fire mode. Well, how can you give that team more time instead of ripping apart this team to throw on another resource who now has to onboard, which is going to take someone's time to explain what the problem is. Like there's, 
and I'm like I've got seven minutes left and I don't want to get too much into he's like if you have a larger company and you find that that's difficult let's talk later um, but the the idea of teams with a framework I think is one that works well in bigger companies and it also um, was something that I, I use today the, the eight steps for change management there's a framework there which you can apply you can pick and choose the pieces that are of use to you but the way that you implement change isn't going to be exactly the same as the way someone else implements change because your staff or your team is going to be a little bit different or a little bit further along or a little bit further behind a little less scared a little more afraid of the change that's supposed to happen than someone else's team so those are my three kind of promises that i made to you in the original description ultimately Change doesn't happen by magic. You can't kind of close your eyes. I know it's a disappointment. <laughs> like, table flip, but now she tells me. Um, it doesn't happen by magic. It happens by management and by conscious actions and thinking about what did I do here that worked? Why did this not work? And taking those lessons and moving them forward to the next situation. Um, this URL has the, the slides already uploaded. Um, it has some of the um, sort of hit points in terms of the, the business management uh, things, as well as the URLs, most of the URLs that I mentioned today in a couple of the books. Um, I, we've got sort of five minutes left. I'm happy to continue ranting, but now that you've heard all the stories, maybe there's extra questions. So, any additional questions at this point? Everyone's like, oh, hmm, sleepy, <laughs> too much talking. Yes. When you're implementing change in your organization, mm -hmm. you need resistance, you know, someone will come in, whatever happens. But at what point along the way do you say, okay, oh, yeah, actually, yeah, change is actually not, not working? Yeah. Like you've got these red flags popping up, and you think, no, just change takes time, change doesn't happen by magic. Let's push through, let's push through. Because you can see there's a line at the end of the tunnel, but um, how far that line is, and it, is it getting dimmer? <coughs> So there's, there's a few pieces in there. Um, recently I listened to uh, an Agile Weekly podcast that was talking about uh, the pace of implementing Agile methodologies in traditionally waterfall teams. And one of the things that I thought was really like the sort of like, ah, oh, interesting, was timing. Are you being impatient with a team who is getting there but just getting there really, really, really slowly compared to, it's like, well, I know this is going to be amazing, so it should just happen tomorrow. Um, so pacing is definitely one. Um, and then the other one, which I learned the hard way, um, I love to iterate and improve. I also love spreadsheets. Um, so my team doesn't necessarily love to have the rug ripped out from underneath them every single week. Uh, so iterative improvement is kind of a special sort of hell for people who don't, you know, they they don't want to have to context switch. They don't want to have to think about what's the, what's the fucking methodology we're using this week. <laughs> um, so one of the lessons that I learned in uh, the the process with Joe Schindler was yes, little bits of change are good, but don't change too many things too often. Change like talk about this is the one thing we're going to try. And we're going to, and the, the Agile Weekly podcast said, like, do it for two sprints. Do it for a month. And then say, is that working? Okay, what should we keep about that part of the change and what should we throw out? Okay, now that we've tried, that's the one thing that we were going to focus on practicing. Now let's try the next thing that we're going to focus on practicing. So you've got these sort of windows where you can throw everything out and say nothing there worked. We're going to try this completely different thing. So... As the example, I was trying to make iterative improvements on the process when I was working with Joe. And that, that sort of constant ripping the rug out from underneath was really stressful. So we, we figured out um, what the pieces were going to be. And we went to um, a, and this is described on the Drupalize Me blog. Um, we went to a, um, a pre-launch way of running the project. And then after the launch of the project, we all came together as a team, or the, the product, the, the, um, 
uh, framework upgrade, we got together as a team and we said, okay, how do we actually want to work now that we've hit this milestone? And um, in, a, like, in a really, really positive way, I fired myself from project manager because having a self-directed team was really the direction that Joe wanted to head in. And so it's like, okay, I did the, the, the coaching and the, the sort of task mastering and all of those things to get us to launch. Now we're, we're at that milestone. We don't really need a task manager. Like, it's a three, team of three developers. You can pick your own frigging team, like tickets. Like, I don't, you don't need me to do this. So you don't need the gatekeeper. You don't need that. And it, as sort of time went on, yes, some coaching and yes, some guidance um, ended up being useful. And, and Addy provides that, that um, oversight. Um, but it was figuring out what do we, what are we trying to do? You know, what's the vision for this kind of work and how is the most how can we do that most effectively so that I think sort of timing increments and um, allow yourself to throw things out absolutely yeah I've got two minutes left and I see two questions so yes yeah, it's a question uh, follow into what you yeah. said and probably an answer um, based on a lot of organizations they are hung up on the Methodologies they've yeah. used over the years. Um, and you go into a work, you walk into a client, and you know the solution that you've done previously can be done in a better way, like an added on methodology or some change management structure that's easier to manage. But leadership themselves are resistant to that because they believe their old PMLP process, whatever it is, is always good. So, what are your thoughts on how, as change agents, so step number two on this is assemble a powerful coalition. And it's sort of, I, the, um, I am sure that I've not made this up, but I, uh, I seem to recall somewhere that it's like, it's referred to affectionately as the cabal. <laughs> assemble your team and figure out how to convince the leaders that the change is going to help them specifically as individuals. They are going to spend less time tracing people down. They're going to, um, get bigger bonuses. Like, I have no idea what the incentive structure is in your company, but get your group together, <laughs> convince the leaders that it's a good idea because without that leadership part, it's, it is virtually impossible to implement change that ends in a shift in corporate culture. So you can kind of secretively do things differently, but you're not, you're not going to get to the corporate culture shift if you can't figure out how to change management's um, way of thinking. Did, was there, there was a third, yeah. Yeah, I was actually thinking about how do you do the reverse <laughs> in, yeah. in, in the sense of how do you create friction in a group that just accepts what you say <laughs> and, and you want actually to be challenged more. You, know, you throw out a big change thing and everyone goes, okay, cool. <laughs> and you're like, well, no, I, I'm, this may not, I might not be right. <laughs> yeah. And I want to be challenged. I don't know what circle I would, so as you were saying to me, I was like, oh, that's obviously, and then I was like, no, no, it's not that one. Um, so the challenging piece, and how to get people to challenge people, I would say go back and, and watch Todd's talk on um, empowering, I don't remember the exact title of it, if someone has Google open it, they can check, it's something like empowering self-directed teams or something like that. Um, making sure you don't have a blame culture, making sure that people are, um, Okay, I just want to cover my ass. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, so some of the things in terms of, of blame culture, which are interesting though. So I had a, uh, I'm going to go over time. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to cut myself off on this yeah, one. Okay. Um, I really want to answer all of your questions. I, I've not had anyone come up to me and kick me off stage. So I think I'm just preventing you from getting coffee at this point. <laughs> but I don't have a schedule. Can anyone confirm that? Yeah, we should wrap up. Okay. Yeah. Um, very often, um, um, this change. It's pretty easy. This sounds like a longer comment and a hallway it's discussion. Not, it's not long. It really is. We basically <laughs> just ask questions. We challenge the assumptions. That creates the conversation. And then out of the conversation, basing that conversation on you know, is there evidence for what you want to do? Is there not evidence? Yeah, but that you're saying there's no pushback, and that's the problem. Yeah. That you yeah, you're saying there's no pushback. no pushback. Yeah. You know, because a lot of times in friction. See, longer conversation. Get out, you guys. <laughs>